we won't announce the speakers, but this is Stephen Ellis, and he's our first guy. <laughs> if that will work. Hey, thanks for coming along. Um, I really love speaking at this event. It's kind of a bit of a venting session sometimes. It's a chance for me to get off my chest the things that have been frustrating me all year and hopefully give you pointers and tips and tricks and help you not make some of the mistakes I've been making trying to run and set up and configure some demos. So there's a few war stories here. Uh, I apologize if you don't learn anything new. I will be thankful if I learn something new out the session. That's one of the reasons why I give these talks. And please be patient with me because I'm trying to use slides and I now use my phone instead of a clicker, so it's interesting. So let's see if this works. So, is this a data center in your pocket? Actually, I've given this talk internally inside Red Hat. It was actually called, is this a cloud in your pocket? Um, but Simon is a bit overdone with clouds and you know, many of us run data centers still, but what is a data center in a modern context? It's all about cloud technologies now. So there's a bit of a crossover there in terms of what the content is about. Now, let's see if this works. So, why am I giving this talk? I have to build demos and show off technology to partners and customers on a regular basis. I also talk at lugs and other events. And when I'm doing that, I've got to find a way to get this technology up and running really quickly in a repeatable, reproducible manner. That's a common theme today. And one way of talking to this, and I'm skipping the wrong way now, is I like to say, you know sometimes you say you've got an itch you need to scratch? In my case, I often have problems which are my scratch. You know, those problems that you've, you've got and they're lingering and they're hanging around, but you no longer bother with them because you've kind of got to work around or you've got to... You, you just tend to forget about them. They've always been there. So I like to say, I've got a scratch I need to itch. I need these scratches to become that annoying, I will actually go and solve them. And so around that is, how do I do these things quickly? How do I avoid just having a simple de desk procedure? Many of you are in operations, there are desk procedures you've got to do every day. I want to automate those desk procedures. So I apologize in advance if this talk turns into a session on teaching you how to suck eggs, but hopefully you'll get something new out of it. Hopefully even if you only take out one thing, you go, oh my God, I must never do that. That will really give me pain. I will suddenly find I have no hard drive or similar circumstances. So, our friend Gollum, the egg sucker, what does he ask? He always asks, what have you got in your pockets? And the, you know, one of the things around this is, what do you have in your pocket? Could we run the equivalent of a data center's worth of technology on your mobile phone? I mean, that's the most common thing. We all have one of these in our pocket. Well, most of us in the room, I think, do. And look at the power you're carrying around in your mobile phone today. Quad-core, octa-core, we're starting to see 64-bit processing in our phone. Imagine if you can go into a customer session, go and do a demo at your local log, and be able to show off all that technology just using your mobile phone. You know, we're starting to see mobile phones appear with little mini projectors and all kinds of other add-ons. The eponymous Raspberry Pi is a great piece of tech. I meant to bring one with me, just pull it out. It will literally fit in your pocket. I really want a few of these, you know, the Intel NUX, um, uh, AS Rock have got their little B box. These are great little pieces of tech. You know, we can get an awful lot of, you know, hypervisor capability into one of these units. Or something I've been playing with is I'm often trying to bootstrap a new piece of hardware. So what I've got here is a USB 3.0 memory card reader so I can stick a range of memory cards in. This one's got an installer RHEL 7 that can pretty much boot any piece of hardware in any data center on as long as it's x86. Whether it's UEFI secure boot or old school BIOS based boot. And I'm often out of capacity so what I sometimes use for demos is an external hard drive like this which I am to stick an old 128 gig SSD in. Of a USB 3, it's got more than enough performance for me to run a reasonably sized virtualization stack. But the meat and bones of the session we're going to cover off are playing with nested virtualization, or fun and frustration with nested virtualization, some tips and tricks around using thin LVM, 
so that I can use things like that 128 gig external hard drive and make it seem like it's many petabytes or terabytes at least of storage. Uh, snapshots, a little bit around pulling up technologies like RDO, which is a build of OpenStack, on thin LVM, using snapshots, doing it really quickly, tearing it down again. And if I've got a bit of time, I can also talk about something called Atomic, which is a lightweight cloud-ready environment, and some stuff you can do with that around QCow snapshots. So along the way, we're going to discuss choosing and building the right kind of base images, a few gotchas, a few tips and tricks, and where am I going next? A lot of what I'm doing in this space is still largely uh, old-school BIOS, MBR-based environments, because that's the way most virtual infrastructure works. So what I want to do is retool this to be UEFI-based, because that's the way the hardware is in the data center now. So if I'm going to pretend my VMs are physical machines, I want to pretend that they're running UEFI. And I want to play with ARM64, because that's coming into the data center in the next few years big time. Hardware. Now, what hardware do I use to run these demos in these environments? If your primary environment is a Mac, you might be able to take some of my learnings unless you're going to run Linux natively on it. Everything I'm doing here is about using Linux as my host environment, using libvirt, using LVM snapshots, working in that Linux ecosystem. So whilst my focus is around CentOS, Fedora, or when I'm with customers using Red Hat Enterprise Linux, a lot of this I hope you can quickly retool around using technologies like CentOS and Debian and Arch and all the other popular Linux flavors. So my environment here is a Lenovo ThinkPad. And normally, I'd be using my external hard drive. More on that in a moment. And for the purposes of the demos here, I've built all, everything using CentOS. So it's something that you can go away and use yourself. Now, if you can't read some of the technical detail, all the slides will be available. Everything's copy and pasteable, so you can do all of this yourselves after the session. So along the way, there will be dragons. You know, big, hairy, scaly, horrible dragons. Things go wrong. One of the reasons I'm not using my external hard drive is actually one of those dragons. Playing with thin LVM can have some interesting side effects. So first, nesting. Ah, oh, nesting. No, um, nested virtualization. Why would I do nested virtualization? If you do it properly on modern hardware, much more performance than using QEMU-based software virtualization. A um, couple of pointers. If you're going to do nested virtualization, use an SSD. Use plenty of RAM. Don't try and do it on spinning disk. You're just in for a world of pain. So if you're going to set up nested virtualization, most modern Intel and AMD processors are capable. Now, depending on your processor type, you might not have all of those Intel options up here, because some of these are Xeon specific. So if you're doing this on your laptop, you may not have them all. There's no obvious side effects of setting up your mob probe options this way. It will only enable the options that are available on your core. Um, I actually have a machine at home that's AMD based. That's the only option I typically use on it to give me a nested environment. Along the way, we're going to have power tips. I kind of skipped ahead early. One of them, always use SSD. A second one, I love HD Palm minus T. It's really dumb, but it's great because I know straight away if the hard drive is misbehaving, if the USB bus has decided to connect at two instead of three, if there's other things happening in my environment, I can see it really, really quickly, and that is do a reboot, tidy things up, because honest, you don't want to do this with a USB 2-based attached hard drive. Not very good. So I create a base environment that I'm going to use for all my snapshots going forward. I might use a virtual manager. I might do it on the command line. Once you've got it set up, you typically got to edit the configuration and enable VMX in your CPU features. Otherwise, you won't get nesting in your VMs. One thing about nesting is when the machine comes up, it will try and set up a virtual network. 
If you're not careful, the virtual network will be in the same address range as the virtual network you're using in your host. Again, interesting side effects, things don't behave well, usually libvirt won't start. So either use a different base address range in your host, like 192.168.123, or change it when you build your VM environment that you're going to start using for nested virtualization. How many of you here have played with ThinLVM? I'm impressed. Some of you still got hair. I lost mine. It's gone. Um, so, yeah, do it on SSD. In the case of this, I'm doing it actually on my local internal hard drive. I kicked some stuff out and made enough room to create a thin pool. So, relatively simple. I'll create a thin pool I'm going to use for all my thin environments. Uh, that's a fixed size, though you can configure LVM to grow it dynamically if there's free space left on your SSD. And then I'm going to create a 40 gig environment that I'm going to use for my space CentOS install that I'm going to then use for all my demos. Thin on top of LVM, make sure you fix your LVM config uh, to do issue discards, otherwise trim on your underlying SSD doesn't quite behave nicely. We run Lux encryption. Thin on top of LVM, on top of Lux encryption. Still not quite got that one working. If someone has got it right, and yeah, okay, come and see me later, please, we'll discuss. It's, I'd really not lose my main environment while I'm at the conference though, so maybe I'll do it next week. So, Next thing, we need a base environment we're going to use for spinning up all of this. So, a base OS image, I've usually got one for Fedora, one for CentOS, one for RHEL. Occasionally, I might spin one up for an Ubuntu environment. And I tend to update the base regularly. Whilst I'm spinning up environments off it, they are, and I'll be building and I'll be updating them, every so often, because everything I'm doing is repeatable, I'll kill all of the spun up environments and I'll just refresh the base. It helps keep the storage use on your thin environment under control. And again, about dragons, how do you build your base image? Thin may go wrong. I've hit really interesting odd issues with USB-based attached storage, metadata corruption, uh, having a hard drive attached on my dock and unplug my laptop and walking away is a really good way to cause corruption on thin. So I always use a kickstart. Therefore, I make sure I can quickly rebuild and recover a base image, or I can reuse it elsewhere, or occasionally just like come and talk to me. I can give you my kickstart images to play with. Also, think about your main use cases that you're going to be building demos or using these environments for. One of my primary ones of late has been doing things like OpenStack and Docker and Kubernetes. So. I want a decent size environment so that I can actually install some, uh, push some images into the running OpenStack environment and actually use it properly. So again, all of this is available afterwards. I uh, do partition table. I tend to reserve some space for Cinder in advance uh, rather than have Cinder set up a loopback environment so I can keep that under control. I keep my environment fairly small, but not micro, because I'm going to be using this for a lot of different things. So I want a baseline that kind of makes sense. I poke in my standard SSH keys as part of the kickstart, and I enable yum cache, because I'm going to be patching this. And then what I like to do is make sure I've got a local cache of everything I've been pulling in to these VMs I'm playing with. And the last thing is apparently Kickstart doesn't like having a volume group with a dash in the name. And OpenStack's uh, Packstack installer that I'm going to demo wants Cinder dash volumes to be the volume group it uses for Cinder storage. So I have to fix that up at the end of the Kickstart. So next thing, patch the base because we'll have installed off an ISO or a Pixie or something, and we make sure that that's current. And then I like to keep a content cache, as I mentioned. So what I'll often do when I'm first setting this up is I'll just use rsync. I'll sync you know, var, cache, yum, blah, blah, to my external environment, and I'll sync it back in again. 
every so often. If you want something a bit more elegant, use tools like mRepo. So when I'm doing my rel installs now, I actually have mRepo configured. I'm actually running a local yum repository. So when I update anything, it will go from my local cache ahead of going to the internet, which for using my internet connection at home makes life a lot less painful. If you've got operational management tools, if you're using things like Satellite or Cotello or Foreman or some other tool that can provide you with a repository, great. Use them. Keep content local. Make this repeatable and fast as possible. So the first thing you do, patch the VM, pull the changes back into my local cache so that I'm ready to do it another time. Now, this isn't going to work. Let me just pull. So if actually here, this is, was a clean environment. It's just done a upgrade. And I've just installed RDO, which is a community build of OpenStack, Red Help Support. And I've just installed Packstack, which is a tool for initiating a, an OpenStack environment. So this was just created uh, before you all came in. So what I'm just going to run, which I'll come to shortly, So we'll leave that running. And we'll come back to this. So that now, I'm going to basically be running and installing OpenStack in the background while we're giving the talk, hopefully. Demo gods be kind. So saying about your base image, I like pizza. I've got a wood fire pizza oven at home. I make good pizza. If you're in Auckland, give me a call. Come and have pizza. Um, if you're moving an env existing environment to thin LVM, you need to kind of clean it up a bit. Uh, how many of you here have good Partex foo? How many of you here know what Partex is, have ever used it? Oh, well, that's quite good. Partex is really neat because we want to basically mount the image go and use uh, FS trim to go and clean things up. And actually, you'll notice if you uh, keep an eye on your LVM uh, sizings, you'll notice that the image starts to shrink down as you run FS trim. So we want to slim it right down so that's our starting point before we do anything in anger. And even when you've done some patching and tidy ups, it's worth every so often doing this because I've found occasionally pass through's not quite working, delete's not going all the way down the stack, particularly as I'm running uh, encrypted hard drive. If you're using Vert Manager, it won't always detect thin exists. It's really hard through Vert Manager's GUI, uh, GUI to kind of add thin partitions in or specify them. So in theory, when you're going through the GUI, if you're using that to initiate a new VM, you should be able to just edit the field and add the path in. You know, dev, volume, blah, all good. No, not good. What typically happens is it can't see it properly, so it deletes the image that you've just spent all this time creating and creates a brand new LVM volume. Not good. So if you're going to do this manually, you can use Vert Manager to create the environment, but use Versha to edit the config file and update the XML. Otherwise, you're in for a world of pain. So now snapshots, and snapshots and snapshots of snapshots, and things start to get really interesting. So overall, I found the performance on modern SSDs fairly good for running thin LVM with snapshots. I can easily create extra environments anytime I need them. Uh, a tip I'll give you is use sensible names for the snapshots you're building. I keep discovering I've got screeds of environments, and it's version one, version two, version three, and I can't remember why I created them. One thing with Thin is Thin LVM on modern distros doesn't auto-activate. This is a good thing, because when it goes bad, it goes very bad. And if you've got a half a dozen 
thin volumes active and you lose power, the hard drive, if something goes wrong, you may be in for a world of pain. So now when you've done the create, you need to activate it before the, vo the volume is actually accessible and you can do anything under um, uh, uh, libvert, like do versus start. So we're now going to build a cloud. We're going to start off with our CentOS base. First thing we're going to do is disable Network Manager. It just gets in the way in an OpenStack context. We're going to update our content cache. I'm going to through this quite quick because so all the notes are here. And I'm going to use RDO, which is a great community uh, build of OpenStack, to do the install. So RDO and Packstack. How many of you use DevStack? How many of you used um, just puppet modules and general things to install OpenStack? Have any of you used Fuel? So Packstack's a nice way for operators and users to try out OpenStack. It'll build an environment to a certain scale. It's very simple to use. Uh, it has an answers file, so you can like, configure network a particular way. Very accessible. So the first thing I'll do is update the environment, which I've already done. I'll uh, install OpenStack Packstack. And then all in one basically means I'm just installing it in a VM on my laptop. I could actually define a multi-node environment with separate uh, Nova compute. Minus minus cinder volumes create equal N means it will actually, it's, it, it's a bit counterintuitive. It means it won't create a loopback device. It will go and look for the volume group and use that instead. And when I finish, what I'll do is I'll sync all the changes back to my local repo so I've got a cache for later. I keep lots of notes, whether it's pen and paper, whether you're using Gedit, Gnote, VI, Emacs, somewhere. My favorite place is I, I like track. I've talked about it at other conferences. So I have a little private instance. So when I come to give a talk like this, everything I've done, I've got all the notes, all the pointers, all the trips, all the gotchas. Um, learn firewall D commands in modern like CentOS and RHEL environments or Fedora environments, if that's what you're using. Usually, Packstack gets it right and opens up the right holes. Sometimes, no. I'm actually going to stick, uh, skip that a uh, bit. So what I've got right now is something that's completely repeatable, but it's not entirely automated. So what I could actually do is wrap a bit of Ansible. I could just do it with a shell script. I could actually automate this to the nth degree. But part of it is actually going through the process, because often what I'm doing is I'm trying out a new release of OpenStack or a new release of Docker or Kubernetes or some technology. So you want to see what's breaking, what's going wrong. When you know it works, then automate it. Don't try and automate it when you haven't even tried it out. But it means I patch my base environment. I can re-image my base very quickly. And it means I can experiment a lot. So we're starting to play around with things like software-defined networking, which if you don't get the network configuration to pack stack right in the first place, is a world of pain to configure after the fact. So being able to blow the environment away and recreate it in less than 30 minutes and have a full OpenStack install with the right networking is critical. So some people said to me, why am I using LVM? Why don't I just use QCow? QCow does snapshots. It does thin. It does a lot of these things. Uh, I don't know, I like LVM. LVM makes sense for me. But when I'm playing with something like Atomic, which is a very, very lightweight environment designed for containers, that's when I will use QCow snapshots. If you're going to play with things like Atomic, how many of you use Cloudinit? Yeah, using Cloudinit with um, um, Libvert is kind of fun and interesting learn it. There's a really good guide here up on our website. I believe this one's completely public. Not a lot of effort. You know, you create a meta file that specifies the name. You have a meta file where you inject some data. And then I create an ISO file off that metadata. And then I use QEMU to create a snapshot, a working environment off an upstream atomic. This could be Atomic out of Red Hat, Atomic for Fedora, Atomic for CentOS. Could be another environment you're working with. Uh, the talk I gave yesterday, I pulled down an appliance image for a tool called Manage IQ. Used a very similar Q, uh, QEMU command to create a working environment. 
and then start it. Let install, specify the um, a CD-ROM device that's uh, the cloud init data, and away we go, and we're good to go. So I can do this and quickly spin up three or four or five of these micro environments to play with. Minimal overhead, minimal disk use, all good. Um, one nice thing is that you can re-init the base disk anytime. So as long as you do a shutdown of the VM that you're running, just re-init the base disk. Don't worry about the cloud init disk. You don't need to recreate the VM. Just restart it. Everything comes up. You've got a nice clean environment. You can also do things like snapping your snap. Don't do that when you're running. Do not snapshot a QCOW instance while it's running. Not only will you lose the instance that you think you're creating, you'll lose the instance that you think is safe. You'll lose both ends. Unless you've got something inside the image that can acquiesce and quiesce the environment, world of pain. So it's great. I can play around with these technologies really, really quickly because Atomic already has Docker and Kubernetes and Flannel and all these things ready to run. So it's really easy if you're trying to operationally stand up and play around with containers. This is a really simple entry point. To that end, there's a couple of really nice playbooks, workbooks on this. Again, these are completely public. So if any of you in the room want to go and have a play and try out and try and understand how Kubernetes interacts with Docker, I see these URLs will all be published afterwards, but this is a really nice step-by-step -step how-to guide. You can easily reapply this on your distribution of choice, but it's a, it's a really nice start. So kind of coming back to where we started, you know, why am I doing this? And I said, you know, scratches I need to itch. So the next one for me is very much about UEFI. How many of you deal with UEFI hardware at the moment? How many of you don't? You will at some point. I mean, my laptop's UEFI. You walk into a data center now, it's UEFI. Unless you're purely living in the cloud and you don't care about hardware, UEFI is what you're going to have to deal with. It turns out you can do UEFI instead of BIOS based boot in KVM. It's not very elegant right now. Um, VirtualBox team have also been a doing a chunk of work around UEFI. I don't tend to use VirtualBox. I don't like what it does in terms of kernel modules. So, um, but this is that kind of the next step. Is I want to be able to do a lot of these things with full secure boot enabled. I want to treat it like it's true hardware. The other thing I mentioned earlier is my uh, USB ready, UEFI ready USB key. You try to build a bootable image on a USB key that will work on UEFI hardware. Anyone done it? Good. It's, it's interesting because you end up, you've got to, you know, format the environment in, in, in GPT mode. You're forced the environment to only boot in BIOS mode because you try and boot a USB key it will try often to boot it in MBR mode, old school mode. So unless you force it, you can't even install the key. Um, so what I wanted was a live image that will work on BIOS and UEFI. So first I had this all working on UEFI, but you need different layout. There's a few other tips and tricks to get it working on an old school MBR environment as well. So I do my kind of simple RHEL 7 install. This has got a EFI partition table. Install Grub2. And I have to boot now in legacy mode and make sure everything's working. So there's some pointers there for any of you who want to try it. It's in the guide. But you should be able to do this with Fedora and CentOS as well. And so you can basically have an environment that will work on any class of hardware. So, next. What next? So, I'm going to rework all my demos to be UEFI based at some point. Uh, I want to possibly have a look at doing this with full encryption support as well. I want to fully script. I was hoping to have that ready for today. The, the Kubernetes and Ansible and Docker stuff. I could probably use Ansible now to automate a lot of what I'm doing about standing up uh, rapid cloud environments. 
And the one thing I really want some hardware to play with, so things like this new Pine 64 board and some of the new ARM gear that's coming out, I really want to play with this. Right? I want to play on proper enterprise grade ARM because the, the kit is getting smaller and more powerful all the time. We have to remember that the future in the enterprise isn't necessarily x86. So we've got to start looking towards that. So, any questions? And I need your details to talk about. Yes? Uh, the note you made about the UEFI booting, is that some specific hardware you had trouble with? Like, I have a motherboard where it happily gives me the option to both. So I was wondering, were you finding some hardware will give you the option and some hardware just won't if there is a legacy option? Or you just had to... So some say... Um, you, so the question was about the issues of had booting UEFI versus uh, old school BIOS MBR based. And it really does vary from hardware to hardware. So we were playing around with some Cisco gear, which really was outright refusing to ever boot in old school, mo in, in modern mode. Everything was going old school. And we had to pretty much disable everything we could find in the, the firmware to do with MBR-based booting. If MBR was even vaguely turned on, as soon as you put a USB key or a CD image in, it would boot that way. Uh, same we found with the Lenovo laptops that I've seen, at least uh, T4445 uh, series, uh, 2425 series, even like the X1 Carbon. Unless you're really careful, you suddenly find you've got an old school environment, you haven't gone for an EFI environment. And then it gets really interesting with um, my wife's laptop, it's a full EFI based install, but it's got a out of kernel Broadcom driver, and so I can't run Secure Boot. Any more questions? Okay, so I'm around all week. If uh, these notes will all go to Simon, most of the pointers and tips and tricks tend to go up on my blog inside Red Hat as well. Yeah, it's all good. All right, thank you.